Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Shannon. I know I was sorry for about the bounce around. Welcome. All right. We'll hold for just one more minute. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. I'm Tracy with Californians for the Arts. I'm the uh, manager of programs and organizational advancement for Southern California. And I'd like to kick off the meeting um, by inviting Rick Stein, uh, the president and CEO of Arts Orange County, and also a board member of ours and the immediate past president of California Arts Advocates to welcome you all and start us in our conversation. Rick. Thank you very much, Tracy, and welcome everyone. Uh, I see so many uh, colleagues here uh, in the listing. Uh, I'm very gratified that we have some great attendance today. And, um, you know, it's, it's important that we get uh, uh, up to speed on what is happening on the advocacy front and with California to the Arts and California Arts Advocates being our statewide lead organizations with whom we, as uh, Arts Orange County and our constituent organizations work with very, very closely throughout the years um, on our advocacy work. Uh, it's, it's great to be getting together today. I do wanna begin by acknowledging the, um, the land that we're on, the historic ancestral lands of the Ahashiman Nation, Juan Nino Band of Mission Indians uh, for most of Orange County and the Tongva people in the Northern part of Orange County. And I'd uh, also uh, like to call attention to uh, the racial and cultural equity statement that we have on the artsorangecounty.org, artsoc.org website so that you can know um, where we stand as an organization in terms of our uh, commitments and policies um, and uh, their resources there as well for you and your own organization. Um, with me today is um, Edmund Velasco, who is uh, the president of the Orange County Musicians Association, Local 7 of the American Federation of Musicians. And Edmund is not only a member of the Californians for the Arts and California Arts Advocates Board of Directors, he is also on the Arts Orange County Board of Directors, and it's wonderful to have him with me uh, joining us today. And I'm here to just give you a little overview, so we're going to go through updates from Californians for the Arts and, and California Arts Advocates. Uh, then we have a period where we have a chance to share. All of you will have a chance to share your thoughts and field reflections and have a discussion of priorities. And then uh, we will be uh, having an update, uh, just a very brief update from me, but then uh, we have a special guest with us today, Jennifer Ward, who's the Senior Vice President of Government Relations for the Orange County Business Council, uh, which is you know, our Chamber of Commerce for all of Orange County. It's, it's the mega uh, chamber. And um, I had asked her uh, what she knew about the redistricting situation because the remapping of all of our districts on the city, county, state, and federal levels uh, are uh, in a uh, county as large and as complex as Orange County with so much representation is a bit mind boggling. And she is going to demystify it for us and let us know where we stand and then we can start sorting that out. We'll know who, what districts we're in and who is representing us. Um, and then we'll have a closing um, uh, comments from California's of the Arts. So Tracy, who's next? <laughs> I believe I am. Um, okay. So I just wanted to go over some of the, the format uh, for this Zoom, uh, because this is actually a Zoom meeting, it's not a webinar. So um, uh, just want to go over some of the ground, um, the procedures to um, enable closed captioning. Uh, click on the live transcript icon on the Zoom bar, the menu bar. That's the one down at the very end. It says CC. Um, raise, uh, use the raise hand function if you would like to speak or put questions in the chat. Please mute your audio when you're not speaking. Be mindful of your own input. Be on topic, no long speeches. We only have a limited amount of time and it, um, we want everybody to be able to participate. Use wait. Why am, aren't I talking? Let the others speak and finish thoughts. 
make space, take space equitably. Uh, use the chat to share resources. Like if you if somebody has a topic that you know that there's a there's some link that you know exists, you can put it in the chat. And um, uh, also um, include your email so people can follow up with you. And this meeting is being recorded and it will be available later on, um, um, uh, I believe on our site, correct? Yes, and in email, we'll be sending out an email. All right. Thank you. Okay, everyone. So to um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, you've already met our collaborating partners and co-hosts for this event, but I wanted to share with you that we'll be sharing a lot of information and links and resources, as, uh, as well as the slide, uh, the whole slide deck and a recording and a follow-up email so that um, everything that we share with you today will be available later. I wanted to let you know that. And um, do we have any other, if we have any other board members on the call um, to use the raise hand feature, you, you use the reaction icon down in the bottom uh, of your screen and under there is raise hand. So you, you can use that to speak later. I wanted to make sure for everyone, but if we have any other board members that, um, that are here that I can acknowledge, Okay, thank you. And I'd like to introduce our staff. If staff could please raise hand, um, use the raise hand feature. Of course, everyone probably knows our uh, Julie Baker, our executive director. I'm uh, Tracy, as I introduced before. Eduardo is our manager of communications and field engagement. And Kara Smith, um, is a, the, my, the Northern California counterpart manager of programs and organizational advancement. And um, Kara and I will be managing um, comments and questions in the chat and keeping track, uh, keeping track of those as we have discussions. Next slide, please. So this is our third annual regional conversation. Uh, this is the fifth out of 11 this year. And you can check our website. We'll put a, a link in the chat if you would like to attend any of the other conversations. And um, this has been a lifeline for us in terms of uh, hearing, getting input from you, sharing information, and um, shaping, informing, and shaping our work and empowering us to fight on your behalf. And from last year's regional conversation, the link in this, in this document will show you a summary of the input and, and we'll talk shortly about the accomplishments we were able to achieve because of your participation in the regional conversation. And I'm going to, and we will be sharing a summary from this year's input as well. And I'd like to uh, pass the mic over to our executive director, Julie Baker, so she can talk more about those accomplishments and our state and federal priorities and um, updates. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tracy. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Ed Edmund, for all your um, support as board members and all the incredible work you do in Orange County. Um, thank you to everyone who's here today. It's great to see some familiar names, um, and I look forward to being in conversation with you. Uh, my name is Julie Baker. I, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm coming from the unceded land of the Nevada City Rancheria Nisanon, otherwise known as Nevada City, California, about an hour northeast of Sacramento, where normally I'd be spending a lot of time, but these days I'm just zooming in meetings in Sacramento and here today in Orange County. Quickly, I want to just re review a little bit about our two organizations. Um, we have a C4, which is a lobbying organization, California Arts Advocates, um, and we uh, have a lobbyist in Sacramento. We actually work very closely to influence um, allocations, appropriations, resources to support the sustainability of the arts, culture, and creative industries and workforce. Uh, we work on legislation, we work on the budget, and uh, we are making sure that we are in rooms we've never been in before and representing our very important industry to California. Um, at the same time, we have a C3, the five, uh, a nonprofit organization, Californians for the Arts, uh, which basically is an advocacy service organization. We're really here to both translate what's happening in terms of policy and legislation, give you the tools to be effective advocates locally at the statewide and the federal level, and um, to be here as a resource for you um, as we all are uh, learning um, and building our advocacy muscles. All right, next slide. 
So I also wanted to just talk about a little bit about where we are as an organization, um, our statement of values. We are on a journey to be an anti-racist organization. And when I say a journey, it is that we, we, we've certainly written the statements, but the statements as we know are not, are not now, we are there. We are working um, both internally to look at our policies, our procedures, our hiring practices, every aspect of the way that we do work and, um, and the 400 years and the systems of oppression that we've all uh, been under in order to make sure that there's truly equitable systems and access uh, for all. That is not only internal, but also in externally in what we fight for. And we hold ourselves accountable and we work toward transparency in these efforts, but we also ask you to hold us accountable to these efforts as well. Next slide. Um, quickly, this is some of the things that we achieved uh, in this last year. Obviously, this was a very difficult year for our sector. The last, we're in our third year now of the pandemic. It's hard to believe, I know. And uh, this last year, you engaged with us at uh, unbelievable levels, over 300% increase in advocacy engagement. You sent letters, you wrote emails, um, you met with your representatives, and Orange County has a big impact, particularly here in the state, particularly this last year when we had Sharon Quirk Silva, the assembly member from Orange County, as the chair of the Arts Assembly Committee. And she was really, really worked very closely with us to make sure that we were being heard in hearings, as well as helping to champion uh, what we came together and we asked for a billion dollars in recovery for the arts sector. We worked with our colleagues at NEVA, National Independent Venues Association of California, as well as California Association of Museums. And in the end, we realized over $600 million was invested back into the recovery of the arts, culture, and creative industries and workforce. In addition, we saw the very first creative workforce bill signed into law, which we'll talk a little bit about today as well. And mayors from across the state really helped to support and lift up the urgency of this matter. And we were really um, happy to see that because when they see that at the local level, they, uh, they being the state, then says this is really important to our communities and to our constituents into our districts, they're more likely to support um, our efforts. Next slide. Again, some highlights real quickly um, from Californians for the Arts. Last year, we created a survey um, where we uh, really tried to understand what is the true impact of what was happening from COVID-19. Uh, this was then released with the Otis Report and was actually quoted in the New York Times, where we talked about that if California didn't invest or create workforce um, pipeline, uh, we could be fa facing a cultural depression. This certainly does, you know, the kind of media awareness, public Public awareness is a big piece of what we do at Californians for the Arts. As we know, this also influences uh, what uh, decisions get made um, when we're talking about resource allocation, whether it's state, federal, or local level. Um, many, uh, some of the people here on the call today, John Forsyth joined us on the statewide reopening the arts task force. We met a lot with um, California Department of Public Health, uh, GOB is the Governor's Office of Business Ec Economic Development to share with them what we needed in order to restart the arts and how we could do that safely um, and, and get back to business and how critical it was for us to get back to business as we are not an industry that needs to be sidelined. In fact, we are the industry not only can bring people back together safely, but can really help in terms of um, gathering uh, and, and social cohesion, community health and economic health. Uh, to that degree, we also created a campaign around artists or second responders, where we also got a resolution in the Senate and Assembly this last year recognizing artists in their valuable work uh, to support um, our uh, social and emotional wellness. Um, we did a number of other things, including Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And we also um, have been active in helping organizations apply for some of the things we were able to activate at in our lobbying, including the California Relief Grant, the California Venues Grant Program. And then also um, this last year, you may have recalled the California Arts Council, when they came out in July with only 21% of grant applications being funded, we quickly mobilized the field, got over 1,100 of you to sign a petition. And by the next month, they doubled down and got more money out into the field, which many of you have not yet received, even though you were awarded. And our understanding is that will be coming in early February. Next slide. 
on the California Arts Advocates side uh, of the fence, where we I, I sometimes just change my glasses to say now I'm the executive director of that versus the C3. Um, again, you know, major investments were realized, the California Creative Workforce Act, a lot of this work where we testified in hearings, put together hearings, and really worked on reopening guidelines. Um, and supported advocacy around the impact of what AB5 has uh, had on our sector in uh, legislation called SB805, which uh, was not uh, passed, in fact, it was vetoed by the governor, but we did realize investments um, into the California um, Office of Small Business Advocate for close to $50 million to support uh, small budget nonprofit arts organizations under $2 million um, with uh, payroll support. So that will be coming up soon. Next slide. So to give you quickly the, uh, you know, so we all work together, we got all these amazing investments, where's the money is the next question and how can I access it? So uh, the one I just mentioned, uh, the RFP just went out to see who will actually take on that program through the Office of Small Business Advocate. So far to date, it's been a um, company called Lendistry. We're not certain if that will be again, but uh, you can be assured we will be in there advising and making sure that it really addresses the needs of the field. And that will be for support um, for payroll and other system uh, costs like that and up to grants up to $75,000. Um, there is a venues grant program that has already closed opened and closed. Um, it is now, uh, they're, uh, they're looking at those applications. If you have applied, you don't know what the status of your application is, you're confused. Any of those things, please let us know. If you've been declined, we need to know. And if you've been awarded, we need to know. This really helps us in our advocacy as we met yesterday with the director of the Office of Small Business Advocate to ensure that these programs that we fight so hard for actually meet the needs and get the funding out to uh, the, the, the field. There is a museum grant program that we also fought for. $50 million should be coming up this first quarter as well in grants through the Natural Resources Agency and stay tuned for that. And then the California California Arts Council um, received uh, an additional um, influx of $100 million um, in two programs, Creative Youth Development and the California Creative Core Pilot Program, which I'll go into a little bit more detail in a second. So if you advance me to the next slide. And I encourage you to, of course, if you're not already, to sign up for our email and you'll learn always about these um, pieces when they become available. Creative Youth Development, as I mentioned, um, is $40 million over the next three years for the California Arts Council, the State Arts Agency to spend. They are um, addressing uh, these, these particular programs, Youth Arts Action, Artists in Schools, Arts Education Exposure, Jump Starts, and Arts Integration Training. Some of those opened uh, just a couple of days ago, January 19th. More will open in the spring. And again, um, there's more information both on our, um, through our email, as well as on the California Arts Council's website, of course. In fact, they did a webinar today. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> In addition, the Creative Core pro, um, pilot program is something we worked very closely with the administration to educate them around what, how can we employ and engage artists in service to being part of the solution, whether that is through um, educating people around what are the public health needs, uh, whether that's to, in the very beginning, it was to isolate, wear masks, social distance, now it is to get vaccinated, now it's to get boosted, um, and now uh, also around environmental, civic, and social engagement. How can we utilize artists in um, as great communicators as they are in our communities in very culturally specific ways to address these types of issues. So that program um, is in uh, development right now with the Arts Council. They have 60 million also over three years to, to make that program happen. And we should see guidelines coming out this spring and opening up as well. So stay tuned for more on that. And included in this deck is an example of the San Francisco um, core program that some of this was modeled after that you can get some ideas on how you could apply for this going forward. Next slide, please. And um, so the, the California budget gets introduced in January, every January by the governor. Um, I, I wanna just note to the governor Newsom, this is his fourth year and every year that he has been in office, he has introduced proactively in his January budget, some funding for the arts. Uh, so we call him a friend to the arts. We're grateful for the administration's support. The California Arts Council is the state arts agency. That's primarily where funding goes. However, we've been really pleased to see it going to other agencies as well, because that really is our strategy in terms of 
of arts integration, that we're not just siloed, uh, but we are seeing ourselves in small business, um, we're seeing ourselves in workforce development, and we're seeing ourselves in transportation and the clean California um, and other things. So uh, it really spreads the dollars around uh, for our industry. California Arts Council's um, baseline budget is $26 million. That um, we see no change yet um, from uh, the beginning of this budget process. However, there is support um, in the governor's budget for uh, cultural districts. There are $30 million over th three years to be spent to both um, enhance the existing 14 pilot um, um, areas as well as expand to new districts. Um, and so we'll be keeping, uh, we are in support of this, but we're also keeping a close eye to make sure that they meet their equity targets as done in an assessment in September of 2019. About $200,000 has also been introduced to um, support the California Poet Laureate and Youth Poet Laureate program. Um, and then an exciting new state parks partnership. This funding would actually go to the state parks, not the state arts agency, California Arts Council, It'd be $50 million in one-time funding, again, um, to uh, utilize artists, to uh, create performances, 3D installations, um, sculptures, uh, to beautify and enhance the cultural connection for our parks and our communities. And of course, we're also in support of that. And then also included in the governor's budget, um, is a, oh, close to a billion dollars for arts education after school programs, K through six and summer programs. Um, and uh, Create California is the leading advocacy organization in the state for arts education. We work closely with them and um, we are happy to see these types of things um, in the governor's budget as well. Next slide. The next slide gives you an idea of what the budget process looks like. This is something we're deeply engaged in, um, particularly in our lobbying efforts. Uh, the next several months, I'll be uh, with our lobbyists on a lot of phone calls and meetings with people who are chairs and on the committees for the, that will hear these budget items. We will also be working with legislators to introduce some of the things that we wanna see prioritized in addition to the governor's budget, which I'll talk about in a second. And then in May, what will start to happen is the governor will introduce what it's called his May Revise. This is after months of sort of hearing from the legislature, a little bit of back and forth. And by uh, next slide, by June 15th, the legislature has to uh, approve um, a budget because otherwise they don't get paid. And then um, in July, the governor typically signs it. It's usually uh, early July, you'll see that being signed. And then again, there might be some back and forth where you have budget tailor bills, which kind of clean up language. Um, and there might be pieces pe pulled out. This year, also the governor has introduced a billion point four um, in early action dollars. And that includes things like sick, um, uh, paid sick leave, uh, due to COVID um, and for employees with um, businesses over 26 uh, people. Looks like the legislature has also agreed to that. Um, and then also more uh, funding for COVID testing and just really trying to address the impacts of Omicron. Um, so next slide. Trying to get through this. Uh, so here we go. The California Creative Workforce Act is something that we were so excited to get signed last year. Senator Ben Allen introduced it. We were a primary sponsor on this. It's the first of its kind in the United States. Um, however, it got signed by the governor, which is fantastic. This is a real laborious process to get your bill signed. So it was really exciting, but it didn't have an appropriation. It had no dollars attached. So this year's advocacy that we'll ask you to engage on is to see $50 million to fund this bill so that we can and um, look at about a thousand jobs being created, new jobs being created in the creative industries with an emphasis on living wage and diversifying this workforce for people who've experienced barriers to employment. Uh, SB 805, will, this coalition, which is addressing the impact of AB 5 is meeting and determining next steps. So stay tuned to hear what, what we're looking at there. We are going to be asking a, a legislator to introduce um, a budget increase. We can ask, but we can't do it. So we need a legislator to do that. And that is to take it from $26 million in the baseline budget for the Arts Council to the 40 million. We love these one-time programs. It's great to see an emphasis on state parks and other things, but we also know that we what we need ideally for our sector is sustainable funding for general operations. And when the pie is less than a dollar per capita, we certainly can't get there. And we know every program for the California Arts Council is 
oversubscribe. So this is our argument to make sure that we are at least getting to a dollar per capita. So we'll hope you'll join us in that fight as well. This year, we will of course support the cultural districts, the parks. Um, we also are recognizing the devastation happening again from Omicron and the costs to um, keep our doors open and to keep people safe. And so we're looking at and meeting with the administration to, to discuss how can we fit into some of this early action funding and to make sure that maybe businesses that are disproportionately impacted have reimbursements or could we um, get another round of cultural institutions funding from the relief grant program and so on. So rest assured, we are addressing that and looking at that. And then finally, I wanted to mention there is an arts education ballot measure that was uh, introduced by Austin Butner from Los Angeles. It's an $800 million um, ballot that measure that would take from the general fund of around $800 million every year and allocate it to arts education in our schools. So then it would go to the local district. We are following this very closely and we will have more information on that. It needs to get a million signatures by May uh, and then it would be on your ballot in November. So stay tuned for more information on that. Next slide. Um, again, this is just a little bit more information on the California Creative Workforce Act. I'm going to just jump right now to a wonderful uh, a video from our Senator Ben Allen. I say our Senator in that he also is the Chairman of the Joint Committee on the Arts, a big friend to the arts. And so here from here from Senator Allen. Well, hi, everybody. State Senator Ben Allen here. I'm proud to chair the Joint Committee on the Arts, the Legislature's Arts Joint Committee. And I just wanna welcome everyone uh, to the California for the Arts Winter 2022 Regional Conversations. I'm standing outside our, our beautiful capital, and I wanna wish everyone, of course, a very, very happy new year. And I wanna thank the arts community for all the work you've put in over the last couple of years during this incredibly difficult pandemic. We know that artists not only have been at the front lines of suffering and bearing the brunt of the pandemic, but artists have also been at the front line of helping our society respond to and heal from the trauma associated with the pandemic and all the other uh, challenges that we've had as a society over the last couple of years. Artists as second responders coming in and into the breach and helping our society come back together and heal uh, as we have suffered from traumas. This of course has uh, been something that, that I've been talking a lot about as we've been trying to get more money for the arts and the arts did very well in the 2021-2022 budget and I'm really happy to see the governor uh, reiterate support for the arts in the upcoming budget proposal that he just presented. Uh, it was ridiculous how little we were funding arts when I first got into the legislature. And I'm just proud that we've all been able to come together and dramatically increase funding for arts through grants programs, California Arts Council, arts and education programs, and the list goes on and on. So uh, one of the things I just want to mention, our, our Creative Workforce Act that we work together on to get passed, which is going to try to create a mechanism for uh, kids coming from underrepresented groups to, to, to get more pathways into, into the arts and into the creative industries. And it's something we're hoping to get funded and something I know I'll be working with many people from California for the arts in that endeavor and that effort. Uh, just, our door continues to be open. We're looking for opportunities to, to bring up new issues relating to arts policy. Everything from the TV film tax credit extension and expansion to arts in schools and what we can do to make sure that kids aren't slipping behind in terms of exposure to the arts and their education to looking at the issues of, of arts as a, as, a, as a healer, both for veterans for folks who suffered from all sorts of different types of trauma. And then the every, everyday challenges that arts and artists have been facing, trying to make ends meet and trying to be successful and thrive uh, under the change in climate here uh, in our state. So I just wanna to, to, to welcome you, to thank you for your continued advocacy and engagement in arts policy. And as always, we have a very open door in our office. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you so much, happy new year. So we're really grateful to Senator Allen. As you can see, we have a great champion in the state Senate among many others as well. Um, and so we're just really pleased that he is able to recognize the, the, the value uh, and impact of, of what our, our sector brings to the state. Um, so I always want you to know how many great champions we have in the legislature, as well as the administration. Um, I also want to give a federal advocacy update. California uh, Arts Advocates and Californians for the Arts, we also work in the federal realm. As we all know, there's federal funding, which is much larger than what we can do at the state. 
it, some of it comes down to the state and then some of it goes down to local. So it makes sense that we're there. Um, there's some seven, actually, currently seven pieces of legislation that have been introduced in Congress that are around the creative industries and supporting the creative workforce. Um, one of them is called the Creative Economy Revitalization Act. Um, Representative Jay Obernolte and Senator Alex Padilla both have sponsored um, and, and su supported this legislation, which means that there's bipartisan support. And this is uh, about the WPA, Works Progress Administration type bill for the 21st century, uh, uh, allocating $300 million. Um, we have uh, sent out, actually, I think it was just this week, some ways that you can sign on in support of all of these pieces of legislation. Um, and uh, if you want more information, please do reach out to us. Um, there's also appropriations for the federal agencies, National Endowment uh, for the Arts and National um, Endowment for Humanities, um, and you can see increases there as well, uh, which we'll see when uh, appropriations maybe goes through where, where we land. Um, there's things around the SVOG, the Shutter Venues Operators Grant Extension Act to try and al have allowable expenses not end in March 2020, but to March 2023. Um, Employee retention tax credits were, um, you know, pulled out of the fourth quarter of 2021. We're trying to see if we can get those reinstated. Um, we're also looking at potential COVID-19 relief. Some of that's being discussed already for disproportionately impacted industries, such as restaurants and live events. Um, and so we're continuing to track that. And then just last week, there was an exciting hearing on the power, peril, and promise of the creative economy to the Small Business Administration. And California representatives Judy Chu and Young Kim um, from your district actually sit on the committee. And um, we've been in touch directly with both of those offices in support. Um, and then Representative Judy Chu, after hearing the hearing, which you can watch, uh, we have a link on our website, um, uh, then sent a letter to to the Small Business Administration, which is actually run by Isabel Guzman, who used to be here in the state of California, to encourage her to um, reopen. There's $2 billion left in this SVOG, Shuttered Venues Operators Grant, to make sure that doesn't get absorbed back into the general budget, but that we're actually seeing that um, going continue to uh, go back to our sector. So stay tuned for more information on that. And then finally, I think I'm closing today uh, with a, a short video also from Senator Alex Padilla, because again, I think it's really important important for all of us out there to recognize who are our champions in both the Congress and in our state um, houses as well. So, Senator Padilla. Hello, Californians for the Arts. I want to thank you for gathering to support and uplift our creative community through this COVID-19 pandemic. Inspiring art enriches our lives and our communities. And California is a global leader in empowering artists of all backgrounds to tell their stories. But the reality is that creative workers were among the hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic, with more than 62% experiencing unemployment. That's why in October, I was proud to join a group of my colleagues to introduce the Creative Economy Re Revitalization Act. This bill will help bolster the creative economy by employing artists and writers to create publicly available art. Now, this measure will also support local artists who continue to feel the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. California's creative economy is also a critical engine of our state's success, generating millions of jobs and billions of dollars in economic activity. As part of my commitment to the arts, I am also working to increase funding for the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities. Both endowments received an additional $135 million through the American Rescue Plan a bill that I was proud to support. The ARP also delivered critical relief through economic injury disaster loans, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. As we respond to the changing conditions of the pandemic, I'll continue to advocate for California's artists in the United States Senate. By sharing your voices and stories, you can help pass the Creative Economy Revitalization Act and support the arts in years to come. I thank you for joining this conversation today and look forward to continuing our work together. I think that is the end of that part. I apologize if I went a little bit over. There's so much to report. I try to do it as quickly as possible, but try to keep it comprehensive as well. Um, I, I thank everyone 
for their support and, and, and what you've done to make sure that we had those accomplishments last year. And uh, we'll, we'll again this year, I am certain of it as we work together. So um, right now, just to open it up, if anyone has um, some questions regarding what I just presented, or any specific comments. And just as a reminder, um, one of the, you know, in terms of our meeting agreements, uh, what we talked about at the top of the hour as well. So I invite you to ask or put anything also in the chat as well. Oh boy, Orange County is shy. I don't believe it. Maybe you're uh, just really thorough. <laughs> I'm just, oh, sorry. Yeah, or, and you have amazing leadership in Orange County as well. So I'm sure you're all just incredibly informed as well. But if no one has any uh, questions. I'd like to just uh, yeah. jump in here for a second. Please. Uh, as you can see, uh, Julie is quite a dynamo and uh, that her efforts, her extraordinary efforts have been recognized not only by all of us uh, who work with her on a day-to-day -day basis, but Americans for the Arts awarded her the Aline Volcanus Award for State Advocacy work in 2021. And uh, it was really well-deserved recognition on a national level for uh, the incredible success that we've had, but it, we just would never have been there uh, without her leadership. So applauding Julie. That's really kind of you. Thank you, Rick. And I, I am so grateful for an amazing board with leadership like Rick and Edmund. And you guys are very lucky to have such incredible representation also at the state level with those folks. Um, and I see some great leadership here throughout as I'm looking at all of you. But again, if you have any comments or questions, um, you can also add those to the chat. But if not, let's just continue on because we were I was a little bit over anyway, and we want to get to um, the next piece, which is actually where you get to tell us uh, more information, but you can do it through a survey. Um, it will take about five minutes. So I'm going to head it to my hand it to my colleague Eduardo Robles. Oh, Orange County, Eduardo Robles here. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so at, at um, this point of the regional conversation, um, we want to kindly ask you to uh, fill out our, our regional conversations poll. And um, a lot of these questions are going to help inform our kind of our, our policy, our policy initiatives, you know, it's going to inform our programming. And um, so a lot of this information we're, we're going to carefully assess and, um, you know, uh, distribute back into, into the public and our audience. So if you can kindly just kind of think thoughtfully and um, uh, answer answer each question. And if you don't finish in five to seven minutes, it's okay, just come back to it. Um, but we would really appreciate it if you did complete it and submit it because uh, we are gonna um, engage with, with, with your, with your uh, opinions um, and uh, responses. So uh, feel free um, <clears throat> to turn off your video and um, submit your survey by the end of the meeting or, or uh, come back to it. Um, thank you so much. You booked a Sunny Verbo ski shop.
can we start um, to try to wrap up in the next minute or two? Is that okay? And you can leave your survey open to the end of the program in case you want to add more or uh, adjust any answers. We're going to move shift over to discussion, um, uh, some discussion about uh, some of the questions asked within the survey. And I'll ask Kara to facilitate that discussion. Yes. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, we wanted to take a little bit of a chance to move the discussion from entering data into the survey into this space here and, and really just here for you is really our primary goal today. And so we wanted to start with a question fielded to you about um, from your perspective, from the work that you do, um, what are your current needs or priorities? And again, feel free to just raise your hand and, and and pipe up um, or um, put, put a note or a thought into the chat and we'll pick them up there as well. But we'd love to hear um, from this group this afternoon. John Forsyth is shared in the chat with us. COVID assistance, funding for major capital development and community engagement, and arts education program support, particularly as institutional funding has dried up. Think Irvine Foundation gone, among others. Thank you, John. Yeah, so anybody else seeing similar issues that you're um, facing and uh, we've heard in other conversations around space being an issue for some people, access to space to do their work. Um, I guess I'll just elaborate on a couple of things. Sure, that'd be great. Uh, if there's not others chiming in. Um, you know, obviously with Omicron, there's been an, just now a renewed hesitancy to return to concert life, performing life. And um, this is on the eve of our renewal subscription campaigns. The combination is really worrisome. And I think that 2223 and, and the echo into 2324 in terms of cash flow, in terms of audience scale, um, is, is very, very concerning because obviously audience often feeds philanthropy. And if we're increasingly reliant on individual donors, which we are in Orange County, then that's a you know, very amplified impact of what's happened this fall. So the timing isn't good. And I think we're gonna be in that sort of big capital need. And I think donors that have been supporting us for the last few years, especially at the larger levels, the, the fatigue is pretty high. Uh, the story of COVID is annoying, to, you know, and it's hard to express a clear vision that you know you can deliver on in, in this environment. So all of that just means that relief, relief support is um, very much needed, as is programmatic innovation funds. So I just put that, put that out there. Yeah, absolutely. You know, this is what we're explaining. We had actually a, a meeting, John, yesterday with the director of the Office of Small Business Advocate and other people in the administration recently. We're just trying to explain that, you know, a lot of the last year you were prepared in a sense, right? You prepared your budgets for that, plus your expenses were lower because you didn't have the expense of bringing people back to work and your performers and all of the things that you were doing, the marketing. And then all of a sudden now we prepared for what we thought was back to business. And of course, uh, this winter um, we've had We've not been able to get back to what we think is business, as well as the fact that we see this audience hesitation. And so this is really important for us to lift up and, and, and to share. And I would suggest that um, in your local communities, and I know Rick is such an amazing leader to do this with you, um, you know, in terms of just making sure that you're I know that your media is hearing about this, your electeds are hearing about it, because that is how we can maybe get to some point of change is that uh, they just, they think we're okay. 
you know, they think that uh, the industry is back open. They think we're past relief and we're in recovery. They don't want to talk about relief anymore. They like to talk about recovery. <laughs> so uh, it's a challenge and we all have to work together to educate and inform. So thank you, John, um, as always, for your, um, your information and, and your work there. Um, seeing more in the chat as well, lack of exploration of utilizing existing empty commercial buildings to entice artists to the county. Actually, thank you, Jacqueline, for that. Um, and um, accessible COVID tests, so we can provide them. Absolutely. Um, that's something we're absolutely seeing um, and wondering what the state can do about that with this billion four that they're um, putting out there and if there's any um, help for, I mean, obviously they're spending a lot of money on schools, which they should, but we've also got industries like our own that, um, you know, the cost of testing alone is extremely high. I think you're all experiencing that, particularly if you're in the performing arts. Does anyone else want to add at this point? Um, Renee, are you jumping in? I see you moving closer. <laughs> Yeah, I did have a question. Can I ask it? Please. I'm curious as to the funding opportunities that might be available for those of us who are associated with universities. It's been really difficult coming out of COVID for us because we don't, we just, we don't qualify for most funding opportunities. And it's put us in a very difficult situation. Um, thank you for that, Renee, and I think that's really important um, for us to understand. I believe the Live Venues Grant Program you were able to apply for here at the state. We were able to get that uh, okay, I think. Is that right? I think we did change that. Did you apply I, for that? We had an issue with that, and I, for, okay. our, our development person told me, I don't know if it was because, our, because of the, the level of... Um, what the awesome. major organization made or what it was, but there was a problem okay. with it. And so we're still in a situation where we okay. haven't been able to get anything. I think one thing I would say too to that, and when we maybe Renee, you and I could do an um, offline one-on-one -on -one and maybe with Rick as well, but we should look at maybe the universities coming together, the performing arts yes. uh, particularly, and maybe doing a coalition letter that shares what are the pain points and where you've missed out. Because I think, again, it's a matter of education. Mm -hmm. They assume that you're being well taken care of by the funding <laughs> from your university and that you don't need additional support. So I think that um, maybe that's you know, all, this is part of why we do these regional conversation. It gets my brain right. going and thinking, where, where are the gaps? Where are the pain points? Where do we need to, um, uh, to come together in advocacy? So Renee, maybe I'll, I'll if you want to, I'll put my email here in the chat too. Let's, let's connect on that. And John, I, I see that. you with your hand um, also. Go ahead. Yeah, just in, in terms of that note, um, when COVID first hit, you know, all the university, the Cal State galleries and museums, we had never communicated with one another. Uh -huh. And so I just built a quick email list of all the other galleries and shot them out an email and said, let's meet on Zoom. And since that point in March of 2020, was it? Uh, we've all been in communication monthly. We have monthly, we have a meeting tomorrow. Uh, and we talk about what's going on each campus and we're advocating and we're figuring out mutual funders. We're figuring out, we started a whole program for mutual lectures. So it's this virtual program and we've gotten, like we had 10,000 people on one of our lectures, which was kind of insane. Um, so it's been a real good advocacy group. So I would suggest doing that to all the venues in your university system and connecting with them because we didn't know each other before. And now we all are completely connected and exchanging information daily, you know, almost daily. That's great, John. Really appreciate that. 18, 18 of the campuses are involved. So it's kind of crazy. Yeah. Now, again, I think it's something that people just don't see that, in, that understand that particular niche. So Renee, reach out to me and let's talk about that through Cal Presenters as well, something that we could put together. That would be fantastic, because I know there's a lot of people I've been talking to. Thank you. Good. Yeah, you bet, you bet. Edmund? Yeah, just uh, really quickly, just to jump up what John was saying, um, uh, a lot of our uh, sister musician unions in California have been doing exactly that. We meet on a weekly basis so that we can actually figure out, you know, solutions to problems that, um, and employers have um, that, you know, we try to work where right now we're really 
I know that unions sometimes get a, a bad rap with employers, but we are truly trying to find ways to get through all this together because we know that we are a team. And um, uh, I just wanted to kind of reach out as far as, you know, coming from an, the artist side and not a presenter side, it's, it's a little bit different dynamic, but it is uh, right now we are doing everything we can to make sure that um, both sides get through all this. Because it's been, it's been a heck of the last two and a half years. Thank you, John, and thank you, Edmund, for sharing about these alliances and um, uh, and collaborations that are being formed. We asked that question in the survey if there are any activities or or a group like this that are that are forming, so that we can share that with a, with um, all the participants. And or you can, if you're trying to form an alliance or you have one established that you like the attendees to know about, you can also put that in the chat. Thank you. Connie. There. Um, I'm an individual artist, a ceramic artist, and my needs are a lot different than what you're discussing, but I thought I might as well throw them out. I've pretty much lost my ability to be in the public and sell my ceramics because um, nobody's holding festivals, et cetera, et cetera. And I made a decision long ago after losing some pieces through the mail that I won't mail my I won't ship my ceramics. So I'm by that limiting myself to local venues. But for two years, it's kind of been dried up. <laughs> that was just local artist input. Yeah, Connie, thank you for that. We've heard that also in other meetings as well. Um, and hopefully you were able to access some of the federal programs like pandemic unemployment assistance or PPP, or if you have a sole proprietorship, maybe this California relief grant program. Um, but certainly we know that that is continued issue. And we're, we are definitely looking at what are ways that artists can be supported throughout this. I mean, there are a lot of interesting pilot programs um, now happening across the state in terms of things like um, uh, guaranteed income pilot programs for artists, uh, uh, other sort of portable benefits, issues around unemployment that we've seen, um, that sort of thing. So something we're definitely trying to understand and explore and see what kind of systems are available out there. So thank you for that. We appreciate um, the input. Yes, and I did receive a grant through the city of Santa Ana that was very, very helpful. Excellent. Well, I'm sure you can thank Rick Stein for his advocacy there on Arts Orange County for uh, making sure that your artists are being heard and seen and the value, not only economic, but social uh, impact of what you do. So thank you. Um, I see some more comments in the chat. Kara, Tracy, where are we in terms of time? Do we want to move to the next either question or to the next part of your agenda? Thanks everyone. And, and we do save the chats. Those are also super valuable for us. And that survey, I know we're all tired of surveys, but we took the time in between. And I can tell you, we've had almost 200 people already respond and it's invaluable for us. So please, if you haven't had a chance to finish it, do finish it before uh, maybe tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you everyone. And we're going to, um shift gears and turn the stage over to Rick Stein again to uh, start us on some local updates and then we'll hear from Jennifer Ward which should be uh, Rick will introduce her about what's happening with redistricting in your county. Thank you, Thank you Tracy. So um, yes I'd like to uh, you know remind you that uh, we followed a model, you know, similar to what Californians for the Arts was doing and Americans for the Arts was doing at the start of the pandemic when we saw pretty immediately uh, what was happening and that there was going to be a devastating impact, uh, both for our venues, our artists, and in the arts education arena. And so uh, there were a number of things that uh, we launched right into. We pivoted the, the word of the year, of course, uh, for all of us and um, shifted really uh, our focus almost entirely on 
pandemic-related uh, advocacy for the arts communities. So uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> so um, as of October 2021, our arts, uh, our Orange County arts community had benefited to the tune of more than $85 million in relief funds. Now, uh, admittedly, 78 million of that was the federal shuttered venue operator grants program. And that benefited not just nonprofit uh, uh, venues, but also uh, commercial venues as well in the entertainment uh, um, uh, ecology. Uh, but uh, we were able to secure uh, about $7 million in direct funding from a variety of uh, sources, uh, primarily the County of Orange, which had never in its history been an arts funder in any sustainable way. And um, first we pried some loose during the CARES Act when they had CARES Act funds and then uh, from the American Rescue Plan Act. Uh, and we wound up uh, actually being asked to manage the grant making for over $2 million of that. Uh, over 175 individual artists received financial assistance and more than 200 arts organizations were funded and arts related businesses as well. Uh, so uh, we, we got there because we conducted research. And so uh, the little survey that was on this Zoom today and other surveys that you know come your way, we do really need that as ammunition to make our case with elected officials uh, we met with uh, elected officials at federal, state, and local levels and um, had very successful meetings with them. And um, we also uh, wanted to keep in touch with all of you, and we held more than 100 Zoom briefings over the past two years and continue to do so. Uh, we wish we could go back to in-person in uh, meetings, but uh, uh, and we will eventually. And uh, we also raised some uh, private funds as well uh, and generated more than 40 articles uh, and uh, um, television stories uh, about the condition of the arts community here in Orange County. So uh, that being said, I think that, you know, we still have uh, the pandemic uh, afflicting us and our advocacy continues. Um, the, the really good news is that I think that it was very much a wake up call to elected officials. Uh, they suddenly realized what it might be like if there were no arts organizations or artists in Orange County, uh, that, that our community thrives because of us. And at so many levels, you know, a health level, a therapeutic level, an economic level, and a quality of life level. And uh, as a result, we have kind of a confluence of support that we have never seen in the history of Orange County among our elected officials in terms of supporting the arts. And um, uh, the best example of that recently was a meeting I had with uh, Doug Chafee, who is now the chair of the Orange County Board of Supervisors, who said to me right off that he, would like during his chairmanship to pursue the establishment of ongoing arts funding from the county. So uh, I asked him if he would entertain the opportunity for us to present him with a white paper on that with a case statement and uh, various options that they could look at uh, based on models used in other communities. He said, absolutely. And so we are working on that now. We are very hopeful. Uh, my, my hope would be that during Arts, Culture, and Creativity Month in April, that uh, we might get them to vote on uh, a new program of funding on an ongoing basis for our arts community. But you will be hearing from Arts Orange County between now and then um, in order to secure more uh, research information that we need to make our case, as well as to enlist your efforts in writing letters and emails and perhaps appearing um, uh, in Zoom briefings and uh, with elected officials as well as uh, if we are able to appear in person at the uh, Board of Supervisors when they're voting upon it. So you'll hear more uh, from me at that time. And uh, so 
uh, it's my pleasure now to really um, uh, hand off the mic to uh, Jennifer Ward from Orange County Business Council, who's going to give us a briefing on who are these elected officials now we're gonna be dealing with. Some, some are familiar faces and some are being you know, redistricted out of their districts and won't be around any longer. So uh, Jennifer Ward, welcome. Great, thank you so much, Rick and everyone. Um, I am just going to share my screen really quickly, but while I'm getting that loaded up, um, again, my name's Jennifer. I'm with the Orange County Business Council, which like Rick said, is sort of the regional chamber of commerce. Um, we represent primarily large businesses and large employers in Orange County, but we have a really strong partnership, thanks in a large part to Rick and um, our previous CEO, Lucy Dunn, uh, a really strong partnership with not just the large corporations here in Orange County, but with a lot of the nonprofits and those in the arts community um, and those who represent our small businesses as well. So really uh, appreciate the partnership and um, hoping to shed some light on this thing called redistricting today. Um, I am always more than happy to um, answer questions afterwards or if anyone sees anything today that you want more information on both the um, you know, legislative boundaries, legislative advocacy, and elections are something that I track all the time, and it's constantly changing, so feel free to, to reach out afterwards. Um, so with that, I'll just kind of give like a quick background on the uh, history of redistricting. Can everyone, can you see these, Rick, okay, and hear me okay? Okay, great. Thanks, Julie. Um, so just really quickly, like, you know, there was a lot of attention on redistricting this year, but this is really the only only the second time California has gone through this formal redistricting process that's being conducted by a third party. Before 2010, the legislature, so the elected officials themselves, were in charge of drawing the boundaries for their um, territories that they represent, whether that's at the state, federal level. Um, there was numerous laws that passed, and now in California, as well as a few other states, in sync with the United States Census. So, you know, the process to count our population every 10 years. California has a independent redistricting commission made up of appointees from across California who are charged with taking that population data from the census, um, population demographics, voter representation, and using that data to assign new boundaries to the um, territory, the jurisdiction that our various elected officials represent. So they've done it once in 2010 and this 2020 process was the second time they've done it. And um, really the, the reason for that independent commission is to avoid what's called um, a phenomenon called gerrymandering. You've probably you know, heard about it in the news or, or whatnot, but um, this is just sort of a, I've tried to give a visual example from the state's website, um, kind of why redist or why an independent um, review of redistricting is important just in order, like for example, if you have a majority of orange constituents and a minority of purple constituents, there is numerous ways you could divide up that population and, and assign representatives to you know, carry out our democratic process. And if that process of creating those boundaries is allowed to sort of be um, um, done in a way that is sort of unique to each individual elected official's preference, it can result in lines that might seem geographically to make sense, but it results in the minority population, in this case, the purple constituents, not ever having a, a district where their voice is fairly represented. Um, so that's sort of the, the problem it's trying to address. Now, the rules that they have to follow are not just population-based. That's the number one rule is that um, they, each district should try to have an even split of population. So that's sort of why it's tied to the census. Um, and then after that, they try to make sure that districts are sort of near each other geographically. They try to preserve what are called communities of interest. So for example, the city of Anaheim, should it be split in half or should it be 
kept all as one city? Should it, if it is split in half, should it be along a freeway? Should it be along an ethnic community boundary? The, the, all of those communities of interest are um, tried to be preserved through this process, but that is probably the number one source that the public provides input on. So there's a there was a lot of public input over the last year. Um, these independent commissioners, you know, are trying to hear from members of the community if it's important for them to be um, in the same legislative boundary as their neighboring community or not and why. And that obviously, there's a lot of subjectivity to that. So, um, and then again, you know, try to make sure it's something that, you know, constituents recognize and you're not supposed to provide favoritism to existing elected officials. So the commission doesn't have to necessarily look at how this impacts the person who's representing the district right now. Um, so I'm gonna just go through quickly the, the layers of our representation here in Orange County and kind of what they looked like before and what they looked like, what they're gonna look like uh, later this year. The new redistrict, um, the new district maps that were approved by the state at the end of last year don't actually go into effect, so to speak, until the election. So this year we have 2022 midterm elections. The primaries will take place on June 11th and the general election will be November 8th. So um, while those maps are final and sort of adopted at this point, the switch, so to speak, doesn't take place until all of these elected officials who represent us go ahead and run either for their existing district or a new district. So the way I've kind of presented it is to show you the names and the districts of, of who's here and who's gonna be running and then I'll show you a map afterwards. Um, I have to say, if you're if you really want to see a good visual, it's best to go online and look. There's some really good interactive maps where you can zoom in on your address, on your city, on your county, click the district, and it'll tell you the information about it. Um, and I've included those links at the end, and I'll drop them in the chat. So just it's it's a little hard to like get a good visual as a snapshot, but we'll do our best. So um, just quickly, you can see here on the left, all of the elected officials who represent us in Congress and some of the changes. So um, some of the ones that are not changing, oh, sorry, before I go through that, I just wanted to say that the congressional representatives in California is actually one of the biggest things that's changing overall in that we are losing one representative. So we had a total of 53, I believe, and we'll now have 52 um, because California's population didn't grow as fast as other states did. So again, because this, these lines are all tied back to population, overall, they had to squeeze one district out of California. And so that created a lot of reshuffling and primarily um, was taken out of the LA County area. Um, but here in Orange County, we have uh, all but one of our existing elected officials in Congress who will be running again this year. So Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, who just represents a very small portion of Orange County, um, will, be run oops, will be running again in her same district number, although it's different territory. Congresswoman Kim will be running in a new district, the 40th district. Uh, Congresswoman Katie Porter will be um, running also in a new district, the 47th district. And Congressman Lou Correa will be running in the same number, although it geographically looks a little bit different. Um, Congressman Alan Lowenthal is not, he's retiring from Congress and his district actually um, just covered a little bit of Orange County on the border of Orange County and Long Beach. And that district is now mostly Long Beach. So not one you have to worry about anymore. And then Congresswoman Michelle Steele will be running again, but she will be in uh, now the 45th district. And Congressman Mike Levin will also be running in the same number, but different geographic. And I'll just say that I'm sure you, you heard in the federal update earlier and just um, you know in the news how tight the majority is at the federal level right now. There's a very slim majority in both the House and Senate. Um, the Democrats have the majority right now. So these uh, candidates here in Orange County, in particular, Young Kim and Michelle Steele, are going to receive a lot of national attention in their elections this year because those are seen nationally as two races that are 
pretty competitive and maybe hard for those Republicans to, to keep. And so it's um, expect a lot of mail in your mailboxes if you live in those areas. <laughs> so, um, so just again, sorry, it's a little messy, but just to kind of show you what I was talking about in terms of geographic changes. So um, just kind of start at the top here. The 38th district, which just cut was Linda Sanchez, just covers a teeny tiny little bit of Orange County, still only has, um, is mostly LA County cities, Norwalk and things like that, but still has a teeny tiny bit of uh, North Orange County. The 39th district, um, which, uh, excuse me, the 39th district um, now is primarily a Riverside County district. So not one to worry about anymore. The uh, 40, let's see, the, um, so Young Kim's district, which is the uh, 39th, will now be um, more of Yorba Linda, also some of San Bernardino County. The 45th district, which was Katie Porter's, is now a um, more of Brea, Cerritos, Fountain Valley, and that is where Michelle Steele will be running. The 46th district, which was Luke Correa, still Luke Correa, Central Santa Ana, Anaheim, Fullerton. The 47th district, which um, again was Congressman Lowenthal, that district is now the district that covers the coast and uh, which is what Katie Porter will be running in. So it kind of goes along here. 48th district is now a primarily Riverside County district. And then the 49th district, which is South Orange County and San Diego County is where Mike Levin currently serves and will be running in again. All right, moving on to the uh, state side. So at the state level, again, we have um, most of our current senators, state senators, will be running again, with the exception of Senator Newman and Senator Min. And this is an interesting situation. So neither of them are up for election in 2022. They will be up in 2024. But with redistricting, they actually now both live in the same district, in the new 38th district. So um or excuse me the new 29th district so that is a, a weird situation where for the next two years or the next couple of years until that 2024 election senator newman and senator min will have to sort of share that that new district that they represent and um, will have to kind of decide amongst themselves where they uh if they want to sort of divvy up the cities how they want to do it they'll have until 2024 to decide who's going to run or if they're going to run against each other and we don't have any situations in Orange County at the Senate level, but in other parts of the state, the opposite has occurred where a new district now has no one representing it. And in that case, the um, leader of the state Senate, the Senate pro tem will assign that area to sort of the nearest Senator to babysit for lack of a better word. So um, that's kind of some of the nuances that you'll see across the state. Um, but the senators who are up for election this year are Senator Archuleta, who, again, just covers a very small piece of Orange County on the northeast side. Senator Umberg, who you'll see on the next slide, his district is no longer a coastal district. It's more focused on Santa Ana, Anaheim, a sort of central, central Orange County. Uh, Senator Pat Bates, who currently represents South Orange County, she's termed out. She's not allowed to seek re-election in that uh, position anymore. So actually one of our existing assembly women, Janet Nguyen, and uh, a mayor from Huntington Beach so far are those who have put their hat in the ring for that open seat. Um, so just to kind of show you visually, these were the previous represent um, maps. So for example, Senator Umberg, like I said, uh, uh, Sorry, yeah, so Senator Umberg's district, which was previously the 34th, is now more of an inland district over here, Anaheim, Anaheim, Santa Ana. We have the 32nd district, which is a little bit of Orange County, still just a little bit of Orange County. Um, actually, excuse me, sorry, the 32nd 
the, this is why I didn't do numbers from our existing um, or arrows from the existing number to the new number because they're quite different. So even though this little sliver was previously Archuleta's district, the new 32nd is actually way over here and it's mostly Riverside County and some um, Orange County. And so a, an existing Riverside County elected official is running for that district. So there's, you know, there's not necessarily correlation of what the number was before to the new, to the new number. And then we have um, the 36th district, which previously was along the coast or previously was South Orange County. The new 36th is stretches along the coast from Huntington Beach to San Clemente. And that's the one that um, is an open seat that Assemblywoman Janet Wen and uh, Huntington Beach Mayor Kim Carr are running for. And then um, same thing in South Orange County, now sort of inland South Orange County is represented by this new 38th district, which doesn't have a, a incumbent, an existing elected official from Orange County. And so we have some um, elected officials from, some from Orange County and some from North San Diego County who have thrown their, um, or excuse me, candidates who have thrown their hat in the ring for that one. All right. Onto the assembly side, um, a lot of changes as well. I'll kind of maybe start with a map on this one. So you can see our existing assembly districts here. And we have quite a few changes um, in just the geographic representation and who's gonna be running for those. So Philip Chen, same, um, he's running again, but in a new district, we have a new, district, the 64th, that now has some coverage in Orange County that didn't have coverage in our county before. Sharon Quirk Silva will be running again. Um, her district's now the 67th, and it is sort of this, um, this central, uh, again, Anaheim, a little bit of Anaheim, Fullerton area. You have a uh, Assemblyman Tom Daly, who's currently in the 69th, will be now running in the new 68th, which is his district stayed pretty much the same. Uh, another it's just interesting situation in Orange County where Assemblyman Stephen Choi and Assemblywoman Cotty Petrie Norris, who currently are in the 65th and 74th districts, they now, or excuse me, the 68th and the 74th districts, now have a new district that's been drawn for them that uh, they both live in that district. And so they um, are both going to be uh, running against each other, even though they're both incumbents. So it's going to be um, an interesting race for them. And that's in this new 73rd district. Um, and then, like I mentioned, Assemblywoman Janet Gwen, she is leaving her assembly position to run for Senate. So now this is an open district, the uh, 72nd district. And uh, so far, we've seen a couple of candidates put their hat in the race for that. Lastly, um, Assemblywoman Lori Davies, who currently represents South Orange County, has a slightly new redrawn district uh, that still includes San Clemente, and she'll be running in that race. So lastly, at the county level, um, sorry, I'll speed this up. Um, this is probably the one that maybe most directs, you know, directly rep, uh, impacts our local organizations here in Orange County. The five county supervisors who currently cover these districts have now adjusted their maps to what's shown over here. So again, like the numbers don't necessarily correlate, but affect, essentially they broke up this long coastal district into a first district that covers the north part of the coast and an uh, internal district here, district two. They've extended the South County district up a little bit, and but taken some of the inland piece of it out. And that is now in the third district. And uh, the fourth district is probably the one that changed the least. So just going to who is in that area. Supervisor Doe, who is, currently representing district one. He is not up for election until 2024 and that district will actually be open because um, Supervisor Doe will be termed out at that point. Supervisor Foley, who currently lives here in Costa Mesa and uh, represents district two, 
was drawn out of her district. So she now lives in uh, district five. So she had a decision to make, which was, do I move back into district two and continue to represent, you know, these cities? Or do I stay where I live and seek election for a new district that covers quite a few new cities that she doesn't currently represent? And that's what she's going to do. She's indicated that she is going to run for district five, um, which is currently Lisa Bartlett's district, but she's also termed out. So, um, uh, so, so far, Supervisor Foley is um, one of the main candidates in that race. Supervisor uh, Wagner, who represents District 3, who kind of gained some of in uh, inland South Orange County, he's also not up for re-election this year. That will be 2024. Um, and then finally, Supervisor Chafee, who represents District 4, will be running for re-election again in 2022. So sorry, that was a lot. Um, just kind of wanted to like su summarize with what happens now. As I mentioned, the new districts take effect in the June 2022 primary elections and they continue for the next decade. Um, sorry, I didn't uh, finish that bullet, but the elected officials represent their existing district until they, they run for office for their new one. Um, Supervisor Foley, you'll see, has already started um, reaching out to the new district two cities. So she's still sort of representing that until she runs for district five later in the year. And it's just really has created a sort of musical chairs across the state. So at the state level, and this is what this chart shows, there's over 20 different legislators who have decided I'm not going to run for office again, or I'm going to run for Congress instead of the state level, or, you know, I'm going to do something else just because maybe their district is, doesn't look anything like what they originally were elected to represent, or they are put into a district and they're, you know, it's a Democrat versus a Democrat and they just, they don't feel like that's a good um, competition. And so there's a lot of different reasons, but it's creating this sort of mass change and exodus from the legislature, which is an opportunity to, um, to, you know, focus on candidates this year who are key to your priorities and to, to advocate for their election. Um, and then just lastly, I'll say cities are, um, some cities are doing their own redistricting process as well. So a lot of cities in Orange County already have districts, some do not. Um, some that are changing their districts this year are Brea and Garden Grove, just an example. And then school districts also have the opportunity to redistrict, um, but have a little bit more time. So. Sorry, that was a lot of information. Um, this slide, which I'll share with everyone, has a lot of links to those maps that I showed that you can really get a better sense of, of the representation. Um, I didn't also go into the demographics of the new districts, but again, the one of the primary goals is to ensure better representation of, amongst uh, you know different demographic groups. And on these websites, you can see the breakdown of of um, ethnicities within each of those districts. And so that's uh, a key part of the picture as well. So I'll drop these links in the chat. I'll stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions. And I just want to say, I'm, I'm sure like as you all see in the, the news, these elections change very rapidly. So if, if I got a few of the names wrong, I am happy to correct that information and get you our master matrix at some point. Thank you so very much, Jennifer. Would we be able to share this slide with our uh, with the attendees in our follow up email? This slide. Yes, absolutely. Great, great. Thank you so very much. And I, I'm sorry we don't have time for uh, questions because we want to be able to uh, let folks get on with their evening. Um, but thank you very much. And we just want to quickly share some of the um, uh, activities that are coming up next. Uh, of course, art. Term Creativity Month is coming up in April, where we activate the state. Um, this year's theme is the arts work to heal, to build community, to advance justice, to empower youth, to stimulate economies. We will have, next slide please, we will have weekly webinars and, um, and action calls to action related to those themes. Uh, and we will also be providing advocacy trainings that will culminate in Advocacy Week, April 25th to the 29th, where we will help organize you as delegates to meet 
uh, via Zoom virtually probably with your elected officials. And we might, if depending on where we're at with uh, keeping everybody safe from COVID, we might be able to also organize an in-person advocacy day in Sacramento. So we hope um, that you'll join us and get involved in Arts, Culture and Creativity Month. Next slide. Great. I'm going to jump in here and um, some of you might remember I came to Orange County and actually uh, thanks to Rick was able to do a presentation around the impact of AB5 and what um, that meant for uh, the arts and so we are now doing a webinar next week with uh, theater producers of Southern California. The space is limited though so I encourage you to sign up if you're interested in attending. Um, it is $20 um, if you're not a member of Californians for the Arts um, or theater producers of Southern California. If you are a member, it is free. And if you wanna join, I'm gonna hand it off to the next slide and to Kara to give you that information as well. Yes, I just put a link in the chat. Thank you so much to those of you who are here who are, who are members, members are so important to the work that we do. You can join um, either of our organizations as an organization or as an individual. There's information on that in that link. And we also will include that in our follow-up. So we hope you will join us as a member. And we just want to also say thank you to our funders who also make our work possible. And with that, Tracy, I'll let you take us home. Thank you, everyone. We again captured your questions and comments in the chat, and we'll um, be providing a follow up email. And thank you to Rick Stein and to Edmund Velasco for your partnership in creating this event. Um, and we uh, will be uh, following up with you. Thanks, Jennifer, for that comprehensive presentation oh. as well. We look forward to sharing that with everyone who registered, who was also not able to attend. And we encourage you to show up at um, uh, when they're doing their stuff around being elected and ask questions about do they support the arts. I know Rick is very engaged in that process. We have also information on our own website, questions that you can ask, um, and uh, we encourage you to hold them accountable. They are your elected officials. So thanks everyone for bringing, uh, showing up here today. Um, please do reach out to us if you have any more comments that you didn't or things that you didn't get a chance to say today. We do want to hear from you. And if you didn't get a chance to finish the survey, please do. It really does help us advance uh, the work for the sector. So thanks. Have a great night. And um, thanks uh, to everyone in OC.